varying the point p, you maybe wouldn't, you might end up attaching, if, if f is like going to the same point twice, you might end up attaching different vectors to the same point. So you'd start with a vector field, and then if you sort of string these things together, you'd get something that attaches two vectors to a point, which is bad form for a vector field. It's an attachment of one thing at each point in the object, right? Um, so if you, if you want to see these things more careful, like introductions, this is a great book to do what I'm trying to do in here in much greater detail. And, uh, but, you know, it would take me hundreds of hours <coughs> to properly exposit this book. So I just, if you're interested in manifold theory, you should read that book. Um, it's a book I tried to get men to read. Um, <coughs> he read parts of it. Anyway, so here, I mean, he's reading, I think he's read all of it now, maybe, but uh, what's the definition? Well, oh, to define a derivation over here, what do you need to do? This would be an element of what? The derivations at f of p of n, right? So to understand how this works, I have to feed it a function over here because it'll, it's, it acts as a differential operator on such functions. So this is going to be a hard road to follow. What I need to do is take this and feed it a g, where g is some mapping from, say, um, you know, n to the reals. You'd say, well, don't you, you really just need, I, you'd say, well, don't you really just need g close to the point f of p? Like, do you need g to be a function on the whole of manifold n? Well, I don't, but there's a trick using a bump function that, like, you can always take function defined locally in a manifold and then, like, extend it past that to be defined on the whole manifold such that like the local data will match up with the globally defined function so like everything local we're calculating is the same so it's kind of a sloppiness but you can always take the domain of a function to be the whole manifold by using the bump function to extend past where you are it's, it's kind of a it's easy to say but I lost several days of my life once calculating that bump function it's not at all an easy thing to actually work out you can find it in Warner's Foundations of the Group's book, I think. I, I, I have the proof somewhere I can show you. Yes, me. But um, <coughs> anyway, getting back to what what has to be the case here? What are we going to do? We have he's got to we ought to do something with x, right? It's got to be something with this derivation. And this does what? This eats functions based at p, right? So what's it going to be? F composed with G would be my first G, guess. G composed with F. Yeah, G composed with F is what makes sense, though, right? Yeah. Because G, well, see, let's start with F. F goes from M to N, and then G goes from N over here to R, right? So F, G composed with F goes from M to R. This is, in fact, yes, a function based at P, which we can feed to the derivation x of p, and it makes sense. And that, in fact, is the definition of the differential. <coughs> now you want a formula for it, right? Um, so, let's see here. Here's where I usually get really confused. Um, I'll try not to. So this is something like Um, at the point P, and then this one, if you don't mind, I'm going, to omit, I'm, I'm going to omit the point dependence here as to not go nuts. This one we could say span by the derivations partial y1, partial ym. All right. This notation means real span, all right? So then, like, in terms of these... <clears throat> Let's see here. How's it? 
go. D, P, F. Uh, da, 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 da. See, I really want to understand. Partial, partial, say X, I. And I'm going to let it act on Y, J. That would be what? That should be partial, partial XI, right? Of? YJ. Right. And so, if you feed this, that's basically how the basis connects. Um, I mean, this right, would be, um, I don't know how to say this. This is the jth component of the image. See, if you, if you act on the jth component of the jth component function, remember, like over here, this is the ith component of x, right? So if, if, if this df, dpf of xi is, is a vector over in, in, in n, if I act on yj, that gives me the jth component of this thing, J component of this thing. Um, fine. So, if you just bump it up a notch here and say, you know, x. Well, that's equal to what? It's equal to sum i equals one to n sum j equals 1 to m. So linearity pulls out x upper i, right? And then you've got partial partial xi of yj composed with f. And um, and then of course this this was again was the jth component, right? So this is exactly the coefficient of this thing. And I feel guilty, so now I'll tell you. There, fine. And there is what it looks like in glorious coordinated detail. <laughs> in the case that n is one-dimensional, we have the convention that we drop this, replace it with the number one, and it collapses just back down to like xi times that, which you can rewrite as just x of f. In the case there's just one coordinate function in the range. There it is. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I was thinking it would be fun Maybe that's the wrong word. Um, it might be quasi interesting to push forward, like, I guess you could think about in our example, our SL2R example, you could think about a differential form, like a, oh, let's see, what am I talking about? Um, a vector field, a vector, right, a derivation um, at the identity. And see what it what does it push what does it push down to what does it push forward to what what does it map to under this differential of the coordinate chart right um, one of the homework problems that I always think about assigning when I actually think about assigning homeworks and these sort of things is if I have I mean it's kind of stupid I'll just tell you what happens if you look at like partial partial xi up here and you and you and you study like dx. Dip, use the differential to push it down here, it just maps to partial partial u i. Um, and when we study the pullback, it's the same kind of story. If you look at dx up here, it pulls back down, like dxj pulls down to duj and vice versa. duj push, pulls back up to here to dxj. And it's like there's this natural transference between the, um, the, the coordinate differentials and coordinate derivations up here and, and the corresponding ones in the 
in, in the in Euclidean space. It's not that surprising, really. Um, so if I could, I'm just trying to think of an interesting calculation I could do over here, but I think I'm going to, I'll behave and just go on, because we're kind of trying to get a big picture in here, so I should, I should continue on with our big picture. Extra extravagance. Um, so the next step in this story is, of course, vector fields. Right? Like, what's a vector field? All right? What is a vector field? I mean, generically speaking, on an object, what's a vector field? Assignment of a vector at each point. Right. It's a, it's a, it's a single single value assignment of okay, one, one vector at one point. And so, you know, if I have, if this is M, right? And if I somehow can attach, now this vector, right? Um, so, I mean, I could say maybe, I guess I can use X again for the vector field. The point is, if I take the vector field, right? and I evaluate it at the point P, right? That should be an element of what? TP, M, right? So I have the assignment P maps to a single thing called X of P, and that's an element of TP, M. If I can do that for all P in the manifold, that would be a vector field. That's not... I mean that's that's true, but it doesn't capture something we want in this, in our in our vector fields, which is we we like to study smooth vector fields, right? Um, in other words, like if you could somehow envision this, like here's one, and right and then if you like right here, it's like this, and then there's another one here, it's like that, and then there's like another one here, it's like that, and like infinitesimally, if you like zoom in on a point, they're all like <laughs> yeah, you know, it wouldn't be smooth. Um, now, one way you can capture smoothness is the, and here's like, here's what you typically see done in lower level books, it's just a convenience. But um, if the mapping, how's it go? Something like if you feed x a function, right, that would be a mapping from m to r. If this is smooth, for smooth functions, F. Then, then X is a smooth vector field. Um, <clears throat> kind of a sneaky workaround in some sense. I mean, because I mean, we've been defining smoothness in terms of like the, the totality of the objects we're working with. Now I'm just defining it through this sort of ad hoc procedure in terms of composing with a function, which is smooth, but it's a working definition, right? But maybe it's not a good definition. All right, so let me get to the story here. Um, you see, we're starting to think about different tangent spaces at the same time, right? Like, here's a point P, here's a point Q. They're not the same point, right? So a vector field involves more than one tangent space. It involves tangent spaces at dissimilar points. So the, the next step in the story, right, is to, is to find... I mean, there's all kinds of things you can study about vector fields, right? Do they line up as, like... You can look at... Look for integral curves of vector fields, right? You can look for, like, a path whose tangent... Um, whose tangents... Oh, I guess I have never told you that. If I have a mapping like phi, right, from the reals to the manifold, then what is phi prime equal to? It's something like this. It's the sum i equals 1 to, to m of d d t of x j composed with phi of t times partial partial 
xi at the point of u t. So the derivative of a path has to be a derivation in our in our way of thinking. So then you, you can ask a question, given a vector field, right, x, can you find a vector, given a vector field x, you can ask the question, is it possible to find a curve, right, such that x of phi of t is equal to phi prime of t for all t. So for a given vector field, can you match can you, can you realize that vector field is the tangent field to a particular path? If you can do that, then phi is set to be the integral curve of the vector field. And, you, and from where geometrically you understand the vector field gives you the, uh, like the, uh, well, it is the tangent field, right? Or you could think of the points that phi traces out as the flow line for the vector field. If you think of the vector field as like a velocity field of a liquid or something. <coughs> Yeah. When, when you're talking about the smooth uh, functions, um, mm -hmm. so x maps m to t p of m, right? X maps like our vector field, since like for each point in m, it gives it an element of the tangent space, right? Right. So if you look at f x composed with f, why would that map to r? Uh, let's see here, let me be more explicit. We're looking at the mapping p maps to x of p mm -hmm. on f. So that's a derivation, right, okay. that acts on a function to give me back a point. So maybe x composed with f is a little bit Hard to, I mean, yeah. I okay, mean, it's just not a comp actually a composition of functions. Um, hmm. Yeah, technically no. I guess not. Yes, fair enough, fair enough. <laughs> There. So its its description is less fun. Adding to my comment, maybe this isn't the greatest definition, right? Certainly someone who was interested in category theory would not be fond of this definition. Probably would be bothered to even see it. I don't know. I only had such a person to ask. Well. But <coughs> um, okay, so this leads us to the study of the so-called tangent bundle. All right, the tangent bundle, what's that? All right, well, I think I have to, I think my example must die. Oh, I don't need this anymore. Just it can live. Example lives on. Wah -wah -wah. I like this example. I feel like we can get more mileage out of it with a non-trivial but interesting example. Maybe Friday, I don't know, we'll see. So the tangent bundle, what's the tangent bundle, TM, is the, man, well, it's the union over P and M of the tangent space, the P and M. I have a feeling I'm supposed to say disjoint union here. Let me phone a friend. a minute from now, I know what to look at. 
All right. Um, <coughs> so disjoint union. All right. And um, so it's it's basically the collection, simply the collection of all tangent spaces. All right. And it comes with a, a projection map. So here's the picture I usually think about for this. Something like this. I think of this as being TM, total space, right? And then down here is M, right? And so if I take a particular point, uh, say P, right, over that point, I don't know why I'm doing this three-dimensional thing. I think I can do just fine with this. I don't know. Whatever. It's too much trouble. I'm going to make this picture. So over that point, it's still a heuristic picture. At this point, the fiber over this point, as it's called, is essentially, I think of it as being, well, you can identify it with TPM, all right? Let me put some quotes on that. Um, so, like a point up here, you can, um, what does a point up here look like in TM? This thing right here would be something like P comma V, where V is an element of TPM. You have a projection map. And what happens with the projection map? Well, pi of PV is just P, yeah. So all the, all the tangent bundle is is just attaching the tangent space at each point above the manifold and just thinking of them collectively as one object. Um, now the tangent bundle, this thing, is our first example of a fiber bundle. All right. It's an important example. Fiber bundle, what is a fiber bundle? Fiber bundle is something that we'll talk about more later. Um, there's a fair amount to say there. I don't want to try to squeeze it in right now. Um, let's just focus on this one. But the tangent bundle is, first of all, itself a manifold. So what's the coordinate chart? What, what are coordinate charts on this? Like, if this is u, Right, and if that's a coordinate chart containing P, what's what's a coordinate chart up here? Uh, now I see why I wanted to do that. Oh well, I get them. Something like this, right? Roughly speaking. So what you can do is basically use pi inverse of u. Let's call that thing u tilde. Right, and then I need to define x tilde acting on p comma v for p for p comma v in, in u tilde what would you do and I maybe mean, p is a fixed i don't mean p to be a fixed point here either okay guys it's 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 it roams about <coughs> so how should i define this well what you do is this um, all right. Well, that will be, and oh, by the way, there's x down here, right? Rm. So what I do is I take x uh, pi uh, p comma. Now that right there is something in Rm. And then, here's what you do. You just do nothing more than, than take the vector, all right? And, I mean, there's different ways to write this. Let me write it in the most lowbrow way I can. You just take, basically, just string out the coordinates, v1, v2, da 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 da, vn. This will be an element of R2m. So that the tangent bundle is, is an even dimensional manifold doubles the dimension of your manifold. 
there's lots of slick ways to write this. Here I'm assuming, of course, that v is what v is equal to. The sum of vi, partial, partial xi, okay. The fact that it's based at p is implicit within the definition of the disjoint union. It's made of tuples that are constructed in that way. This system of coordinates I'm describing to you on the tangent bundle is called the adapted coordinate chart. <coughs> a lot of times, people won't write. <laughs> like, there's lots of abuses of language that go on here. Like. People will talk about the coordinates, the x coordinates being up here too, just the same, right? Um, so, I'm trying to think, is there, is there a, can you guys think of a slick way to write this? I mean, of course, these, these, like, you know, vi is what? vi is just equal to v of, you know, v of xi. Or you could write it as dxi of v. I've seen all of these used. You have many flavor options in terms of how you want to present this. Okay, now, compatibility though, right? What if you have another thing? Right, what if you have another overlapping chart, V? Then you define V tilde how? Well, let's say Y tilde on P comma V. How would that be defined? Well, that would be defined as Y I and P, right? And now here's where my notation just got a little shaky. <laughs> so these I should have perhaps defined. These would be better if I had written these as like V of X. Let's agree that this is V of X1. Da, 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 v, that, that, that way the X dependence is manifest. And then here, V of Y1, V of Y. And again, 2m, right? <clears throat> How do you relate these? I mean, they're overlapping charts, right? We're assuming that you intersect V is not empty, right? So this, this, this U tilde up here, right? And awful picture. This <laughs> V tilde, they've got this overlapping region, right? And you want to compare X tilde versus the Y tilde, right? To the R2M and this We should think about what is it what does it look like, right? What do I need to look at? Y tilde. Y tilde composed with X tilde inverse. Tilde inverse, right. What's that look like? I guess I need to come up with some, say down here, this tuple looks like what? Something like, uh, I'll say AB, where A and B are both n-dimensional vectors just for the sake of discussion. <coughs> so this is what? This is something like Y tilde of what? Do some more name calling. Let's call this thing. What do, call what do you want to call this thing? We call it alpha comma beta, for lack of imagination. So you have y tilde of alpha beta, which is by definition what it's.
y of what? y of pi of pi inverse. Um, y of pi of, of, of p, but p was alpha here, right? Right. Sorry, I'm being very, very lowbrow here. Um, and the beta was the vector, right? So we get uh, beta of y1, beta of yn. Now if I could, let's see here, what, what is that though? You write it out, sometimes it helps just to write it again, I don't know. X inverse of AB is equal to alpha beta, right? So pi of alpha beta is what? Oh, I'm sorry, pi of alpha. Mm, sorry, having trouble. Does that make sense? I said pi of pi. Oh, pi of p. I'm an idiot. It's not pi of p. Pi o'clock. Doofus. Grief. It's pi of pv. Right. Come on. Not you guys. Me. Me, me, me. I'll be. Oh, goodness gracious. No wonder I was confused. So, then what is that? I mean... Pi of alpha beta, which is just what? Uh, alpha. Right. What was alpha, though? I mean, I think if I, if I could do this, if I was not being an idiot right now, you'd easily see that this is y composed with x inverse of p, okay? Mm -hmm. And then what you end up with over here, when you study it carefully, and I have a lot of time, um, you end up with, like, basically derivatives of the transition functions. And so you get smoothness because you assume, basically the, the, the fact that the Jacobian matrix of y composed with x inverse, or vice versa, is smooth, is what's needed to show that um, those mappings are smooth. And so that, that's why you get smooth, the compatibility of these adapted charts. It's, it's like that. Okay, all of that said, then the next step is we, we talk about a section of the tangent bundle. It goes the other way like this, S. And a section of the tangent bundle is just a function from like, say, U or some set down here up to there, which is, it's a function. And it's a function such that it doesn't, you know, basically it's a function such that it, it, it hits each fiber just once. Any fiber that it hits, it only hits once, let's say. So that corresponds to a single attachment of a vector at each point over the set for which it's a section. And this gives us a mathematical formalism to carefully say what a vector field is. And then smoothness of a vector field just becomes the smoothness of a section. The smoothness of a section is, again, Manifold, manifold, smoothness of a manifold to manifold map, which is nice. Anyway, I'll try to talk about that more next time, and also the larger problem of fiber bundles. This eventually leads us to the study of curvature and connections, and if we're lucky, we can understand a little bit more about the connection between topology and, and curvature. And if I do it right, I think I should be able to make some connections with, like, gauge theory and the like deeper electrodynamics. What exactly is gauge theory? <coughs> uh, gauge theory is the, um, from a mathematical perspective, I suppose, is the study of principal fiber bundles with, um, I mean, something like that. This is functions on principal fiber bundles and the connection on a principal fiber bundle. And, like the, what we learn eventually is that the connection on a principal fiber bundle corresponds to the potential energy that you know from like physics. Mm -hmm. um, and the curvature of the connection in the principal fiber bundle corresponds to the field strength in physics. I'm talking about second semester physics more so. Mm -hmm. I don't. You said fields, I. Yeah, I, I'm not sure I know how to. 
fit it into first semester physics. That would be kind of more ingenuity. Although you can write gravity as a gauge theory. Um, but anyway, that, that's a longer story. I know. But maybe I can tell you guys this semester at least the bird's eye view of it. Mm -hmm. Share with you a few, a few of my dark secrets from theoretical physics. I don't get to share with people too much around here. Thanks, guys. And maybe, just maybe, we'll find Superman. <laughs> <laughs>